Hey folks, welcome to the Did You Know Crypto Podcast. Today, I had the great, great pleasure of talking to Peter McCormick, a fellow Bitcoin podcaster, although his star vastly outshines mine. It was a great, great conversation. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we agree on. Uh, there's some things that we don't, but, you know, it's it's fine. We can, as two individuals, talk uh, about a lot of different stuff. And it, it's a lot more actually personal than focusing specifically on Bitcoin and all that and uh, it, it was really revealing and I really, really enjoyed it. So I think that you will also. I do have to say the last about 10 to 12 minutes of our conversation, his audio dumped for some reason. Mine did not, but I didn't find out about that till later. Uh, so the interview kind of act, you know, feels abruptly kind of ended um, at, at the very end at about um, for you will be about 56 minutes in. And uh, so it kind of just abruptly ends and then with me ending the episode. But we're going to be uh, doing another one in the in the probably the pretty near future. So we will uh, make sure that we're or that my end is a lot better prepared uh, since I am the interviewer. Right. So it's on me. But anyways, really quick, if you could help me out, I'd really appreciate it. Go over to iTunes, leave a five star and a written review. That is the biggest thing you can do to help me. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you've already done that, thank you so much. And if you hadn't, please consider going over there and doing that, as well as any sort of a rating or reviews on the podcast platforms that you do. Please reach out to me on social media, like and share the pages. And if you want to go a little bit a step further, you can go to supportmypodcast.com. That's supportmypodcast.com for all the other ways that you can help support me, like through Bitbacker, using Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, as well as shopping on Amazon, all those normal things. I really, really appreciate it. And I want to give you guys a quick heads up. I have a members only that's going to be open to all listeners, uh, but you'll have to sign up. But it's going to be a, a uh, listeners only discount coming up. It's going to be multiple discounts for stuff across the across the space that you need uh, from VPNs to hardware wallets to all this kind of stuff. And they're going to be exclusive discounts. So stay tuned. That's going to be coming out probably in the next 30 days. I want to have that launched by mid-May uh, to June 1st. So anyways, I'm running really long. So let's get right into the interview. But first, I'd like to say thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Today, I'd like to welcome a man that needs little introduction, Peter McCormack, host of the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which has quickly become the most popular in the space. Peter, welcome to the show. Hey, man. How you doing? You well? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. And actually, I, I don't... Is there actually any metrics on what is the most popular in the space? Because I know you've been getting pretty heavy downloads in the uh, last couple of months. No, I, I mean, it depends what you, you know, what you call... Like, are you talking about the most uh, popular in crypto or Bitcoin? I, I would have thought if it's crypto, that's probably Laura Shin. You know, she's done an amazing job mm -hmm. for years. I would have thought uh, Epicenter have a very, very good downloads. And Pomp, obviously, as a, as a machine, he does very well. I would like to think maybe in Bitcoin, I wouldn't say it's the best. I would say um, Marty Bent does the best job in Bitcoin. Perhaps maybe I have the most downloads because I'm a, a bit of a noisy loud mouth. So perhaps uh, <laughs> perhaps I do that. And also, I think probably mine appeals a bit more as more of uh, maybe to newer people and and to um, and maybe a bit more entertainment. Um, but uh, you know, I I think it's one of a. I, I'd like to think mine is one of a good group of podcasts. And when people talk about the ones to listen to, they tend to say mine alongside the likes of Stefan de Vera and Marty and Noted. So I'm always quite proud of that, but I, I wouldn't want to say it's the best or the biggest. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, but it, it's definitely been rising up and, and those, those are all great podcasts as well. It's just, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's nice because there's so many uh, voices now in the space. Cause I remember when, you know, when I was first trying to understand Bitcoin um, and I, I didn't even then uh, back in, you know, 2013, 2014, it was just a lot of, of disparate, uh, you know, people who weren't in the space or, you know, we're not really into Bitcoin, but, a pot, you know, an episode here or there about it and then a couple YouTube videos. Um, but it's it's 
you know, it's, it's a really nice for people now because there's a lot of different voices out there and, um, and kind of levels of where you're at. Because uh, I think someone like yourself, is, it's really, you know, what Bitcoin did is a great podcast for people that are, that are just jumping in because um, it's not as, uh, I mean, both of us, neither of us are, are technical people. So when you jump into those podcasts uh, with people that are very technical, uh, it's it, it can be kind of drinking from a fire hose. But I guess that's kind of Bitcoin in general. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's so much to learn and understand. It's really difficult as well. I mean, it's so complicated. It's not only complicated to understand Bitcoin itself. To understand on a technical level, it's very difficult. To understand on in terms of the, uh, economics, it's very difficult. But it's also very difficult to navigate through the various narratives about whether Bitcoin should be the only use of a blockchain or whether there's some merits to Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum, it's very, very hard to nav navigate. And especially, we're always told, don't trust it, verify. Yet often, the reasons I'm kind of veering more towards Bitcoin is because I'm trusting other people's opinions because I don't have the ability or the technical ability or the uh, understanding of economics to give a solid argument to why it's better. So it's one of those weird things where I kind of get in trouble or you know, get some flack because I interview people who are outside of Bitcoin, but I do it because I'm trying to verify myself. Um, so it's very difficult, but we've been trying to do this for a while, man. How long has this been going on? Uh, I, I think about probably about six weeks or so, you know, Michael. there was, no, I mean, it, it, you're busy, you're running around the States. I was just going to say, you know, you, you, you just kind of jumped off a pretty crazy travel schedule and uh, you know, that's just, that's just how it is. It's a, it's a good problem to have uh, when, when you're that busy. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's there's, there's so many things going on always at the same time with me because of, I guess, because what I'm like as a person. So, yeah, it's been super busy, but I'm glad we got to do this, mate. And I'm sorry it's taken so long. Yeah, no, no problem at all. And, you know, usually uh, I, I ask people, you know, how Bitcoin found them kind of, you know, at the beginning of the episode. But I feel that, um, you know, I do that because I feel that both you and I as podcasters are kind of uh, recorders of history in the space. And, and that the story of Bitcoin is found, you know, just as much, I guess, in the in the people as it is in the in the tech advancements, or probably even more so in a way as far as the story goes. Uh, but your, I mean, personal story has been covered so much in your podcasts and and in other interviews. Um, I think that uh, you know, if people want to uh, delve more into that, uh, they could go to what Bitcoin did and kind of uh, you know listen to your earlier podcasts and your story. Um, but what I mainly wanted to actually talk about was uh, something that you also have a lot of experience in, and that that is marketing. Um, how did you get into that field, and and what did you end up doing? Yeah, so that's a very interesting story because it kind of loops back into how I, funnily enough, how I'm back into podcasting. Well, not back into, but into interviewing people. So it's just a, a set of events that, like a chain reaction of things that have happened through my life. So when I was about 15, I remember once, it's a really strange way of explaining it, but I remember once, uh, I was about 14 or 15, I was laying in the bath and I, I was thinking of all these, because I, I was really into my like heavy metal, my Panteras and Biohazards and bands like that. And I just came up with an idea one day, I wanted to do a fanzine. And I kind of wanted just, I, wanted, I always thought I wanted to work in the music industry. I just loved music, I loved heavy metal. So this band called Skunk and Nancy ended up playing in this little venue we've got in Bedford. So I knew the guy, the promoter, because he had a skateboard shop. And I just went around to him and said, look, I want to launch a fancy. Can you help me get an interview with her? And he said, fine. So I did that interview. And similar to the podcast, the most difficult thing I find is getting your first interview. Once you've got an interview, you've got a product and then you've got a product to show people. But without that, you don't have a product. So I managed to get that interview and I think I interviewed the support band and then I got a couple of like local bands. Ended up going to my friend's dad's um, estate agents and printed up 200 copies. And then what I did was go to another concert and just give it out. But having that first issue, it was called The Plug. Having that first issue, I was able to send it around to the record companies and I started phoning them up and saying, look, I've got this fan thing I'm doing. Can I... Um, can I interview some bands? And and what happens is if you're doing a fanzine, you get on the mailing list. So they end up sending you CDs. And if you interview, interview in a band, you get to go to the concert. So it ended up becoming a way that I could get to go to more concerts for free and not buy any of my CDs. So I used to, my parents used to laugh. I used to get like 30, 40 CDs in the post a week. Now, there was like a, a, there was a record company called Lost and Found, an old hardcore label in Europe. I don't know if they're still around. I mean, they would send me a stack of 10 to 15 CDs in one go 
so I've got I've got so many CDs. But anyway, so I did that. I did four issues, and I peaked at interviewing and band. I've interviewed Corn and Slayer and bands like that. And what happened is I stopped it after four issues because it was so much work and selling it. And I went to uni, and it was just around the start of the internet. And I thought I wanted to start again, but I needed a website. I couldn't afford a website. So I ended up uh, staying in, over the summer where I was at university in High Wycombe. I uh, used to work in the day at a place that used to build sound stages. And in the evening, I used to, used to open up my HTML book and learn HTML. Uh, and I, so I ended up building the website for the plug, but I never ended up launching it because what happened then is my landlord had a double glazing business and I was chatting to him about learning web design. He said, oh, cool, can you build me a website? And I was like, fine. So he paid me £400 and it took me like a day. And I was like, wow. <laughs> but bear in mind, I'm a skint student and I was working for like £2.50 an hour in a pub. To earn £400 a day was amazing. And then I ended up getting a job building a website for a recruitment agency in, in the town. And that I got paid £2,500 for and it took me two weeks. So I ended up quitting uni in my third year, which was obviously a stupid thing to do. Just dump my course and... I put my name on a freelancer forum and I got a phone call from one of the early dot com companies. They're called eCountries. And they said, Look, we're looking for HTML developers. Are you available next week? And I said, Yep. They were like, Look, we've got a, a limited budget. We can pay you £900 a week. <laughs> Bear in mind, I was used to earning about, I don't know, £150 a week working all these hours in a pub. So I took the job, went down to London for two weeks, sat there coding web pages. And I just, that, that was what I wanted to do. So I ended up being a like a HTML coder and a uh, like Flash developer for a couple of years, but I soon realised I wanted to work on the business side. So I ended up moving into account management, and then I, I moved to a company in Bedford, where I'm from, where I became the commercial director and then the managing director. And then I moved to London and set up my own agency about ten years ago called McCormack and Morrison, with an old a good old friend of mine, and ran that for eight years. So I ended up working in the kind of digital side of advertising. So that's my background, really. Yeah, I mean, mar marketing, I think, is and one of the reasons I was really excited to talk about it was that um, it, it's something I, I talked to um, at length uh, with Emily Coleman, uh, VP. She's VP of brand and uh, I think it's technically v VP of brand and creative for Shapeshift. And we were talking you know, about how Mark. Yeah, yeah, no, she is. And and uh, we we're talking about how, uh, you know, marketing is just so important. And I think lacking in the space. And by that, I mean, kind of specific marketing um you know not the ty lopez pre-rolls on youtube and all that kind of stuff but kind of the true essence of marketing which is which is telling a story and i think we've done a good job of it uh for the kind of the specific waves of adoption but not not really kind of the general mass market adoption we've done a good job uh to get people you know because the first wave was kind of programmers right very early on very small group and then the next wave was kind of more the people interested in it from political or economic um you know, coming from that side of the fence. But I think that anybody that's going to be interested or really care about Bitcoin from the politics uh, or, or economics are kind of already here, uh, as well as the speculators. And, and that was kind of the third and third wave of, of them. But I don't think we've done a good job of do, telling the story of Bitcoin as it relates and can relate to kind of the the mass the mass public. And I think that we're still trying to figure out what that story is. And that's where I think that marketing uh, would really help, but I think that we we haven't really, you know, we we have the you know podcast and that's all part of it, but I, I don't think that we've done a good concerted effort of really telling Bitcoin story to the masses, I guess. Yeah, and it's a really tough thing to do because it is decentralized, right? So there is no central point of decision making control. So really, the marketing or advertising of it tends to come from whoever's building products on top of it or who are tend to be, I hate the term, but, you know, opinion leaders, people who've got a voice in the space. And therefore, it's never it's never cohesive. And also, Bitcoin is different things to different people. It's, you know, what, what it is to you might be different to me. And, and that's one of the kind of, uh, I don't know, one of the things that's kind of really changed my perspective recently is that I've realized that I've tried to understand what Bitcoin is and I have stole from Epicenter a question that I have in my podcast now where I ask people what Bitcoin is and I realize it's just so many things to so many different people and therefore it's very hard to define it or tell the story of it and I think another thing with Bitcoin is you know, a lot of people see as marketing and advertising as you know, bad words and they certainly can be you know, when when Mark, when Coca-Cola is advertising to you, 
they're selling you a shit product. They are selling you something which is a can of sugar, which isn't healthy and not good for you in any way, but they are advertising it to you. But advertising and uh, marketing or communications can be good if you're telling, if you're selling something good, which is good and you're selling it in the right way. And I guess that's, I kind of fell out of love with the industry. When I left, I ended up writing this, uh, this piece called Online Advertiser Doesn't Work, which was like a very brutal manifesto of all the things wrong with uh, marketing and advertising. And uh, But now I'm starting to kind of get back into it and starting to appreciate it. But I really appreciate good old school copy and advertising, you know, honest stories told in an honest way, with very good creative, but I, I really like good copy. And so, yeah, I'm waffling and going around in circles here, but I'm with you. Storytelling is, is, is really important as long as it's done in the right way. No, I, I agree that that is what makes Bitcoin so hard to to market is we, you know, we're not a centralized company like Coca-Cola um, and, and nor do we want to be, nor do we want to have a central voice that's that's providing a central message of Bitcoin. I, I think that Bitcoin meanings, you know, different things to different people is its strength and, and it's kind of an undervalued asset of the space is that, you know, and especially with the unknown identity of Satoshi as the as the creator of it, um, you know, people are able to glom on their own ideals and things that you know they think that it represents. Um, and Bitcoin's always going to be what Bitcoin is, regardless whether you want it to be libertarian or you want it to be socialist, right, or in between, or or um, or farther outside of that. Uh, it's it's always going to be what it is. So it doesn't really matter what people glom onto it. But with all the different disparate. Uh, identities thrown onto it it gets it gets more adoption that way i just think that we've we you know and it's something i struggle with too i don't have an answer to it um but i i think that the aversion like you said to marketing being something associated with scammers and and uh you know like you said with you know, coca-cola right coca-cola does a great job of advertising they're very it's the most recognized brand <laughs> in the world uh but it's not good for you but then there's a reason why you know, something like kombucha or whatever is not as recognized as Coca-Cola is. And it's a lot to do with their marketing, probably a lot to do with the taste as well. There's a Coke does taste better than a kombucha most days. But um, I, I was going to ask you as well, as far as, you know, you being a, a public personality, I guess, uh, it, it, within the space now and in podcasting, does extroversion and all that kind of come easy to you? Do you get kind of anxious before interviews uh, before going, uh, I know that you emceed a, a conference recently as well, or is that still coming up? I can't remember. Um, do you get anxiety before uh, those those sorts of events? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I suffer from uh, chronic anxiety and panic attacks in, in life. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly over it now, but it does kind of rear its ugly head every now and again uh, into a, like a full-blown panic attack. And anyone who's had one will know how dreadful and awful they are. I used to get them really, really bad, but that's more to do with just a bunch of things that happened in my life rather than it being a something I've always struggled with. I don't look. I don't struggle with. I, I'm an extrovert, and I am a confident person, and probably at sometimes uh, e easily described as arrogant um, and can be a bit of a dick. I, I, I'm, I'm fully aware of that, self aware of that. Um, so I don't really struggle with uh, anxiety. But I will, you know, certain interviews, I will get nervous. I'll get nervous either because it's someone I hugely respect or it's a topic I'm not really comfortable with. But generally speaking, no, I'm OK with that. Having a voice in the space is a very strange thing to get and a very, I don't know, it's a tough adjustment because I'm not I'm not hugely comfortable with it. Um in one way I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it in that it's very good for me if you, if you just look at it as a business I have my podcast is a business like I'm comfortable with it because it's good it's you know I have a podcast that's growing you know I have sponsors that enable me to do this full-time which is an amazing place to be in and I can I am able to try and get I'm able to get very uh, high quality respected people on the podcast so in terms of that I'm I'm comfortable but I'm not comfortable where if people think people think my opinion matters. Uh, I'll tell you why. Is that I don't think I am smart enough. I think there are smarter people out there who need to be heard more than me. So if you want to ask people about the technical merits of Bitcoin or the, the economics of Bitcoin, I'm not the person to answer it because I, I don't have a very good perspective on it. I couldn't write about it. You're much better off listening to a Dan Held or a Nick Carter or any any of the other people, Melton Zawurz, anyone else out there who is 
you know, highly intelligent, very good at explaining this. So, but I, I do like being the person who can maybe help them tell their stories by doing interviews. Um, does that answer? How's that? <laughs> Yeah, no, no. The, the reason I ask is just uh, because I, I heard you talk about it before and, and I have kind of the same thing. So I've, I've had those issues of panic attacks and everything. And I remember because the first time I ever had one was right before um, my, my first kid was born. I was doing uh, some side work um, at, at school uh, doing um, uh, I would, I would mow lawns and pick up dog crap. Actually, it was good money. Uh, it, you know, worked out to be like 45 bucks an hour to, to pick up dog crap because people just don't like to do it. And it worked in between my, my courses. Um, but I remember, I, you know, it, it feels like you're having a heart attack. And and uh, and once I figured out what that was and was able to manage it, it was a lot easier. But I remember hearing you talk about that. And I still get a little bit. It's not as bad um, uh, as, it, as it was. But I remember even just my first interview, I did that with Giacomo. And I remember I was I just remember I was like so nervous to do that, to talk to somebody about, you know, I'm not a technical person. I don't have as much um, uh, knowledge as, as Giacomo does. So it's like one of those things where I don't know, I still always get like a little bit of that before interviews. And it's just always kind of interesting to talk to people that that may or may not have that 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 same that same issue. It's It's not fun at all so they're horrible i mean they are the first one i had was actually an svt so it's more than a panic attack when my heart rate had hit 200 beats per minute um it was um yeah sad to admit but it was uh, drug induced uh, you know i i after the break of my marriage i uh, developed quite a stupid cocaine addiction and yeah my heart rate at 200 beats per minute i was um um, sorry, um, I'm trying to think how to explain it. But I ended up in an ambulance having to go to the hospital and it was awful. It was terrible. Uh, obviously, I got a big warning from the doctor about what the reality of that could have meant and ne- never done it again. Um, but I have still had those panic attacks since. And yes, you feel like you're dying. <laughs> you genuinely feel like this is it. This is the end. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you for my time on Earth. Yeah, and, uh, yeah it's terrible. But I, I know what they are now. They're still awful, but I, I know that how to control them and how to manage them. Um, but they aren't ever related to, they, they never happen related to like an event. I'm like, I don't get nervous around an event that happens. They just are, they just, they just happen. Usually because I'm maybe overstressed, I've got too much on. It's like a stress response, but uh, yeah, not great. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, once, once you're able to kind of name it and, and figure out what it is and what, uh, you know what this what this feeling is it's it's a lot easier to manage once you realize you're not actually going to die yeah um, but uh but yeah I, I found that with you know exercise and trying to get good sleep and and all those kinds of things and healthier lifestyles that that it does help to kind of knock that down but uh you know coming back to the kind of confluence of marketing uh and podcasting you know your approach I've always really appreciated it is one kind of like this radical transparency. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I've always been a fan of as well. And I think it's kind of the, a a major part of the secret sauce for anybody kind of trying to capture public attention. And, you know, in 2019, you know, 20, 30 years ago, this is a different story, but I think that nowadays people really like really connect with, with radical transparency around business, around, you know, just personalities, who they are. Because people don't, you know, appreciate bullshit. And and so, how did you kind of stumble on that? Is that just kind of who you are? Um, is that something that you kind of stumbled in um, during your your marketing time? And and how do you think that this can kind of help the 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 branding of of Bitcoin, I guess, in general? Yeah, I mean, I love radical transparency. I think it's brilliant um, for a number of reasons. Um, you have a very solid defense when people attack you, uh, which I get a lot. And I get people, you know, challenging me or attacking me. And I say, look, I will do everything as transparently as I can forever. Uh, so that's a good defense. But also it makes you really accountable to yourself. But it came from, I'll tell you where it came from. When I was launching my agency in London, I used to read a magazine called Creative Review. A uh, really beautiful creative magazine. And one, they're known for their front covers, these amazing front covers. And one front cover was a kind of like a drawn out to-do list with checkboxes which was all the things they needed to do to get an issue live. It was like the to-do list for an issue with the items that had been ticked off and done. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. So when we launched our agency, McCormick & Morrison, we made our homepage a to-do list of everything to launch the agency from coming up with the branding, to coming up with the design, to 
uh, hiring staff to appointing accountants to legal documents so we made this to-do list of our page and as we did each item we would tick it off and make it a link to a blog post explaining what we did and how we did it so as we launched we were telling the story of the birth of an agency and that created a little bit of traction for us as we built the agency because people were like oh this is kind of cool and interesting so when i launched the podcast when it had gone from just me doing some interviews to thinking okay this is now a business I thought I'll just do the same. I'll make it entirely transparent. Now it does come with kind of various issues. You know, firstly, you are opening yourself up to challenges on the kind of nuances of the information you're sharing. Secondly, it will trigger people. There's absolutely no doubt, especially if you do well at some point. So last, like last month, where I invoiced thirty-seven thousand dollars, you know, on a podcast, that without doubt triggered people. And a very small percentage of people will trigger in a very negative way and will come at you for different reasons. So they might come at you and say, you're just will accept any advertiser. You're just milking Bitcoin. Or they'll come at you and say, you're only uh, interviewing these people because you want clicks because you sell um, you sell awareness. Or even now, because I'm having those challenges with Craig Wright, people are saying to me, you're just selling awareness and you're just doing this to make money, which is completely dumb and completely stupid because I'm risking everything for uh, this Craig Wright thing, and that doesn't, that's not a sensible decision. I'm a sensible business person, right? So I'm, I totally support radical transparency. I think more people should, do, do you know what I think people should do more? It'd be more transparent about their business. And another thing people should do more is admit when they're wrong. I mean, what a great world we would have if more people said, you know what, I was wrong there, I fucked up. Like, I'm more than happy to do that because for a couple of reasons, if you, if you got something wrong, and you keep doubling down, you back yourself into a corner. Exactly what's happening now with Calvin, uh, Calvin Air and Craig Wright. They're doubling down and backing themselves into a corner. But if you get into an argument and you turn around and go, do you know what? I think you're right. I fucked up there. I'm sorry. You completely disarm them and they because they will respect you. And also people will trust you more. So I just think uh, that's something I've always done and always felt that's useful. I've, I've always been very transparent. And I think it works to the benefit of the podcast and, and just myself as well. Yeah, no, I, I've taken, um, I, I don't know, everyone has varying opinions on him, um, but I've always found a lot of good advice. And, and Gary Vaynerchuk, he's kind of been, uh, I, don't, I don't know, not, I don't know if you would call it influence, but he, you know, he's run, now he runs a marketing agency, but he was kind of an early YouTuber, um, kind of made his bones in internet commerce and YouTube, and then jumped onto social before it was popular saying, you know, you need to get a, you know, every business should have a Facebook site was saying that before every business decided to do it when it was already three years too late. Um, and, and he's always been a big advocate of, of kind of like that radical transparency and kind of storytelling as yourself. Right. And that's, I think part of what that transparency is, is telling your story, telling, you know, but the truth, right. Not telling a filtered version of, of your story, but especially if you're running businesses that being open about, especially about the challenges and the failures, uh, definitely humanizes it and people can connect to it uh, yeah, more I, so than just winning every time. Yeah, I, I think I think that's I think you've absolutely nailed it there. And I think what what it comes down to in a podcast is that if you listen to a podcast regularly, it's usually because you buy into the person. Because you could listen to any you can listen to any interview with say Jack Dorsey, but I really want to inter- listen to the one with Joe Rogan. So at first I didn't get Joe Rogan and now I really get him. And now I'm like, I listen to him all the time and and really appreciate his approach to interviewing people. And I guess one of the things I, I've wanted to do with, with my podcast is have people understand there will be a style to my interviews. Like I'm going to ask questions in a specific way. I'm going to conduct an interview in a specific way. And I'm also not going to be scared to interview people that are, are not seen as uh, right, because I've got a Bitcoin podcast or not seen as the standard subject, which is also a funny point, by the way, because whenever I do say an Ethereum or a Bitcoin cash person or somebody who's outside the normal uh, kind of Bitcoin community, I always get attacked and it's like, you're only doing this for clicks and blah, blah, blah. When I do a Bitcoin show, I average twelve to 15,000 downloads. If I do an Ethereum one, I'll be lucky to hit 10,000. So... I never do those shows for the clicks or, 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 or for, I do it for my own intellectual curiosity. And I know there's a percentage of my listeners who also appreciate that. So being ultra transparent, I guess what, what you're doing is you're opening yourself up to your listeners so they can understand you. 
And if they understand you and trust you, then they're going to become a loyal listener of the show. So I guess that's why I do it. Yeah, I've always I've always liked Joe's interview style as well. I like his the you know the long form. Although I don't know how you can some you know doing three four hour interviews that just that just oh, it's seems... the same. What's the longest but, you've done? Uh, I think I did almost two. Um, we did one um, on on a uh, on kind of during the BSV BCH split on on kind of the. The, what they were going to be going on, and I did that with Vin Armani, and I think that went on about almost two hours. Um, but I think most of the time, when you, when you like with that episode, I didn't even realize, you know, because we were just talking, and I didn't realize what was going, you know, how long we'd actually gone until you know closed out, and then it was about two hours. Um, that yeah. you know that one wasn't, but you know, I think um, <clears throat> I think that's the same with Joe, the way he does it, and the way his interview style is. Is a lot of times he's interviewing his friends, and those longer ones are with people like that uh, where, you know, it, uh, it, it goes along the, the conversation. He's not pulling it out to try to get to that. It's just kind of where the conversation leads them. And yeah, um, but it's hard. Like I I've done, I did two hours with Mark Weinstein. I did two hours, 20 with pomp that two hours, 20 with pomp afterwards. I felt wiped out. I was like, Oh, I, I need to have a lay down and my legs were hurting. And you know, I was just mentally drained. So when he does three to four hours, I'm, I'm like, whoa. I'll th- I tell you another thing. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when I listen to podcasts now, I pay a lot more attention to the interviewer rather than the interviewee. I think it's because I want to always improve you know, my, my craft. I want to always become a better interviewer. And so I find myself listening to, to them a lot more. And I've really come to understand and appreciate how amazing Joe Rogan is. Like he gets a lot of stick, but what he does really, really well is he manages to get anybody on with any opinion, however extreme, and gets you to a point where you get to listen and understand and listen to their point of view without it being attacked. So, for example, when I interviewed Peter Ryzen yesterday, people want me, I know what they want. They want me to go on and say, you're a fucking fraud and you're a blah, 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 and what are you doing? Blah. And I, I always try to think, like, how would Rogan do the process? And Rogan would approach it in a way as give him the res- like the respect allow him to speak and, and get his point across but at the same time once he's earned his respect do challenge him on the things that, that he doesn't agree with and i think that's a i think that's a very very good skill he has and, and something i admire yeah I, I i do you know people i've heard that it's kind of funny but it i i don't think it's a dig where they've said joe rogan's oprah for guys and uh but i don't <laughs> think that that's necessarily a dig it is funny but it, it, you know, it, I think that it's a it's a compliment in a way that Oprah is one of the most, if not the most, successful person in sh- in, in show business. Um, her empire is absolutely massive. Joe, you know, I, I remember I went back and uh, you know when when I was trying to figure out, you know, and I still am how I want to do this podcast and and everything. And I went back to you know looking how popular he is now where he has you know five million views you know on a on a episode or nine million views on a really popular episode on 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 just on the youtube side and i was going you know that it's amazing you know he's got this massive studio and i'm going like you know i'd like to have that um instead of you know just like a small soundboard and a mic here in, in a in a basement room and it'd be you know so nice to have but then you if you go back and you actually look at his very first episode it's hilarious because i mean it's just they're they're him and i can't remember who the other guy was on there they're talking to each other you know is this working we are we live streaming right now i don't really know um and you know it's just like dingy basement and they had like kind of like a blanket thing hanging up behind them uh and it's just it's really funny in a good way to look back at you know how far someone like that has come and to go the way that he does it, it may not work for, you know, that's not going to be every podcaster's um, style and, and shouldn't be. It should be how, you know, whatever works best for you. But it works for him in the way that he does it. And it's, I think it's good. It's like parenting, right? Where you look at different parents, you know, you look at your parents and, and, and everything and you try to figure out what are the good aspects that I want to pick out of these individuals. And I think with Joe, it is that ability to branch out, not feel, um, pressured to be an expert on the subject you're interviewing the person about uh and and not feel uh, not not feel that you can't ask a question that may look may make you look like you don't know what you're talking about well i think that 
being and not being an expert thing again is a benefit you know i people say to me oh you shouldn't be doing technical bitcoin interviews because you're not a technical person therefore you can't ask the right questions and i think that's really useful to my audience and i think perhaps that's why uh, why my podcast has resonated with people because i don't get this so i'm like I, rather than uh, assuming how someone would understand something complex like proof of work works or what consensus is, I'm like, look, I don't fucking get it. Can you just explain it to me? And if, if I still don't understand, I'm like, no, you need to explain it to me again. And then um, it, then if it still doesn't make sense, I'll be like, well, that just sounds like nonsense. I don't get it. And I think people appreciate that because I think there are more people like me than there are like the devs or the technical people who do understand it. So I think I think it becomes really useful for the audience. But at the same time, I can see why the, the, the devs get all kind of upset. But my show isn't for them. You know, my show is not for them. They should be listening to Noded or Stefan Levera, not listening to my show. My show is for people like me who just do not have the brain that can process those technical things. But I do have the curiosity to learn about it. And I think that's a really, really useful thing. And that's why it's great that we have a suite of podcast you can listen to i always say to people you know if you enjoy my podcast and you start to feel like you're getting a bit more knowledge definitely go and listen to stefan levera because it will take you a layer deeper you know and that's where i go to learn still my favorite one's marty ben i love i like nothing more than getting in a car like recently i had to drive from la to san fran i could have flown i was like no i'm gonna get in the car I can do some phone calls and I can listen to some podcasts. And I think I back to back like four episodes of Marty Ben and just just kind of like grossed myself in these really really solid uh, in depth conversations. And what a what a great space to be in that we have so many different types of podcasts and so many different ways this these topics are covered. That I just think it's great. I think we're in this golden age of podcasting and it's only going to get better. And actually, funny enough, I'm I am about to launch a new podcast imminently, probably probably at the start of next month. Is, is that going to be because you've talked about that before? We kind of want to branch out of not necessarily Bitcoin, but kind of in, you know interviewing people that you find interesting, kind of as a more general. Is it is it going to be is it going to be that or or is it something else? Yeah, no. So I've been talking about this for about a year, and I'm finally about ready. I, I basically I, I signed up a new sponsor, which allows me to take on an engineer and then someone to manage the production process. So I'm basically reinvesting all that money into having support teams. So I've got more time to do interviews and prep for interviews. And yeah, it's a sister podcast, though. It's not a, a it's, it's going to be a sister podcast. And the reason being is I think it will be a nice bridge into Bitcoin. So whilst it won't be a Bitcoin show, it almost certainly will cover it at times or have topics that relate to it. So my I really enjoyed my interview recently that I did with uh, Ali Eve Knox, who's an adult entertainer. I think it's a, I found that subject really fascinating. It's a, we don't talk about it enough because porn is a taboo, despite the fact that pretty much everybody watches it when uh, when nobody's looking. And I think it's really important we understand how the industry works and, and the kind of shit that some of these actresses go through. I found that super interesting. And But it did touch on pop, uh, um, Bitcoin because, you know, Bitcoin was a way that Ali was able to get paid when she was being deplatformed or, or having her bank accounts shut down. So I find that subject really interesting. I find censorship really interesting. My interview with Andrew Torber from Gab. And yeah, I, I just want to have no limit on the people I could speak to. Because as much as I love Bitcoin, it's quite a stressful, it's very stressful to work in Bitcoin. And I bring it on myself, by the way, but it's very stressful. And I, I feel like I've I've learned so much from Bitcoin. It's exposed me to so many things I wouldn't have been aware of before, like a different angle on economics or a different angle on the way politics works or the world works. And now I just want to branch out. I'm going to do broader interviews with broader uh, uh, guests and broader subjects, but I don't want to get away from Bitcoin. I just think it might be a good chance for people who I can, I can find a new audience and then also bring them into the, the Bitcoin podcast as well. Yeah, no, I've, I've, uh, you know, there, there's been, I, I've been trying to expand out um, into kind of the fringes because I think that's where more there's more meat um, along in there. So I, I've been trying to do that my myself within, um, within kind of going and talking to. I've got some people that are kind of in the developmental archaeology uh, side of things and kind of you know uh, tech, how technology in, in you know influences societies. Um, and, and the kind of the good and the bad of that, uh, it, it try to 
expand out like a little bit but then there's also i do have that same draw of going like well it'd be kind of nice if i could you know I, I really would like to be able to sit down and talk to you know this person but it doesn't really have anything to do with bitcoin so it'd be hard to do directly on the on this podcast but um you know you are you know you're you know you know the history that you've you've talked about is it's been very you know kind of entrepreneurial and kind of you know going out on your own and you've been also uh you had a side gig course um that that you were doing is that is that still uh, going on no so i really wanted to do that i'll tell you what happened was i planned to do it because so many people were like dming me after i was putting my income reports live saying they want to know more blah 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 and i thought you know i'll just do a side gig course and it would just be very simple and i'll take people through all the things i know and it would just have a very small charge because I obviously have to charge my time. And if I don't charge my time, what, I'm not really teaching people. But as soon as I put in the first one, everything on the podcast, I would go mental. I, I just kind of hit a tipping point, I guess. And it just took over. It became suddenly I couldn't do the two. So I did the one I did the one um, webinar and basically had, had a, like a session plan that didn't open floor to everyone and then I'm going to do another follow-up where I just do every now and again I'll just do open sessions where people can ask me questions and I'll share my knowledge but doing a structured course right now is it's too much I, this it also took me away like I, I had the int- like I had the curiosity to, to do it to help people but it was such a distraction from doing the podcast I had to say you know what I've made a mistake here this is too much I can't do this right now I would hope to do it again in the future, though, because I love the thought of people doing their own side gigs and launching their own businesses. And, and if I can help them do that, then great. But no, I've had to put that on the back burner for now. One of the uh, so, so gentlemen I listened to uh, years back, um, and he was actually the, the it was the podcast that first introduced me to Bitcoin in like 2012. He was just kind of mentioning uh, it. And so, so he grew a, a podcast from basically nothing he started out you can't really do this anymore i don't think people have as much uh, tolerance for it but he started out with just a, a a microphone um headset in his car and he would record the podcast on his drive his hour drive um to or from work every morning cool and and he ended up growing that into you know he quit his job um and you know focused solely on the podcast and it's is i think it's gone on for 10 years now because i think he started in 20 two, or i'm sorry 2009 or 2010 um or maybe even earlier and uh he you know did all that and then people come in asking you know that he does he does call-in shows people call in leave a message of a question and everything like that and he kept on getting a lot of these questions about you know how do you start a podcast or you know how do you market something on the internet and so then he um started a, a separate website. It's called five minutes with Jack. It's, it's defunct now. It's still up there, but he basically did like a hundred, like 10 minute episodes on like, you know, here's how you, you know, um, you know, run a Facebook ad or here's how you, you know, use Google ads and stuff like that. And here's how you launch a, you know, a WordPress site. Um, and it, it was, it was very helpful. He kind of got to the point where it's like, if you do everything that I've said, you know, on this website and you still can't, you know, if it doesn't work, then contact me. But until you do everything, you know, and work at it and you're consistent and you're in your content creation, um, then then just keep on doing that until, you know, it, it works out. But uh, I think that's kind of along the same lines as, uh, um, you know, and, and also I think people best learn by watching what other people do. And. I was going to ask you, you know, with your marketing background, what have you actually specifically done to get um, or that you feel is, has been the biggest boost for your podcast? Like, have you done actual, you know, uh, Twitter ads, uh, you know, Facebook ads, or has it been pretty much organic? It's pretty much been organic. Um, a few people have asked kind of what's the secret sauce. And I think there's just a few things. Um so I obviously have a background in marketing. So the branding was very important to me, for me from the start. I knew Twitter was going to be hugely important and I wanted to have a way that there would be something that would stand out. So I designed those banners, the, you know, the black and pink ones with the guest in black and white. I designed those specifically because I know how branding works. People need to see it over and over again. Now, people recognize those those uh, banners and they recognize my branding. The black and pink is very strong. And to accompany that, I built a, a, a quite a solid website with Squarespace. So that was the first thing, because that's kind of like, that's like your your foundations and your groundwork. 
uh, so that you have something to build upon. The next thing I knew that would be really important is the guests. Uh, you know, I hustled so hard to have the best guests possible. So for my first 25 interviews, I did every single one in person, flying around the world to get the best people because I knew, again, that would stand, that would stand out. That would help get the guests. And, you know, the guests, hopefully, they share your shows out. And if they've got a large following, that exposes you to people. Uh, the third thing I did was really spent a lot of time uh, concentrating on ensuring I could do a very solid interview. So lots of prep work, uh, lots rather than just going in cold, making sure I you know, had a very strong product there. And then the other thing I've done is I've just been very, very active on Twitter. Sometimes to I, I fucked up a lot. You know, it's it's a very hard balance to strike between being very engaging and getting you know very engaged audience, but then also not being annoying. And it's really, really hard thing to do. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of engagement now. I can put out some tweets I put out now get plus a thousand likes, you know, some get plus a thousand retweets. Uh, so I've built an engaged audience. That, that, but at the same time, I've made so many mistakes along the way and done stupid things. I certainly have a group of people who probably just think I'm a, a massive dickhead. Uh, I tend to find most people when they meet me in person, if they don't like me on Twitter, they're like, oh, you're nothing like your Twitter profile. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just a, I'm a bit of a troll and a wally online. But but yeah, just I think I think the thing that's helped me most if I, I, is I've been able to do this full time. You know, I've managed to uh, get to the point now where I have sponsors who enab enabled me to do this full time. So I'm always working on the show. Uh, you know, you as you said to me, you have a day day job, but imagine you could just do your show full time. What the difference that would mean to you? It's uh, it's really really helped. No, uh, I, yeah, that would that would be a, a, v a very cool. You know, and it's it's kind of I guess you know. It, I guess some people there's there's two different types of people that do you know something like this it's either you know you want to make this your main thing or it's just you know this is something that I really enjoy doing and it's just kind of a if it makes money that's great if not you know I get to call you know talk to cool people and um I I would definitely you know like to get to the the full time thing I mean mostly because I I imagine uh to an extent you get to kind of make your schedule in a way. Although everyone I think um, that's ever, that hasn't run a business, you know, themselves don't quite realize that it's not as attractive as it sounds where it's like, oh, you know, well, I run my business. I, you know, I can just not, you know, go to work today if I don't want to. And it's not quite that. Usually you have to do quite a bit more work uh, or, you know, twice the work that somebody who's just working a regular day job is going to have to do. Yeah, you know what people say to me, and even some of my friends are like, oh, you're so lucky you get to travel with your job. And, and I'm like, yeah, I, I am. And the experiences that I've had are amazing. But, you know, it's hard work. When when we struggled to get that interview together, I was traveling. Because I, I actually actually canceled you because I was just you know, wiped out. You know, I'm essentially getting on a plane, flying to a city, getting in a taxi, going to a hotel, either going to meet someone for dinner or prepping an interview or getting an interview live. And then moving on to another city. I mean, that last trip I took, I think it was 12 flights in something like 24 days. It's going from city to city, trying to get interviews done, trying to get them live, trying to be, I mean, it's, it was grueling. I had to, I probably three things on that trip I cancelled, including doing our interview. It's grueling and it's tiring and it's also it's lonely. I mean, I sit in my home office all day, every day. My only interactions are either doing interviews or being interviewed and then most of the time I'm just sat in front of my laptop working so I mean it has its benefits you know it's the Easter holidays my kids are up and I'm gonna you know, finish at three o'clock today and we're gonna go and hang out uh, so it does have its benefits but there are a lot of trade-offs that said I wouldn't change it you know I've run my own company I've worked myself and I've had a boss what I do now is definitely my favorite job I've ever had and I, yeah I really really enjoy what I do now yeah, I would, I would say actually my the the favorite interview that you've done um, and the one I was most jealous of was with uh, uh, was with uh, Whitfield Diffie. Um, that was that was, that when was I, amazing. When I saw that, wasn't it? Yeah, when it came out, I was like, oh man, that's like you know just kind of going, oh so lucky. Um, but if there was one interview that you could do again, uh, what would it be, and and how would you change it, and why? Oh, that's a great question. Wow, because most people ask you, what's your favorite interview? If I could do it again, oh, God, Craig Wright. I would like to interview Craig Wright and do that again. I know that sounds crazy. 
most people would be like, why are you giving that fraud a platform? That whole giving a platform thing doesn't make any fucking sense to me anyway. I would like to interview Craig Wright again. i tell you why. I find, I find him really interesting because it is so obvious he is lying. Um, I don't know, have you seen that Netflix series that was on recently called Dirty John? Uh, I have not. Okay, it was re- really popular. It's about this guy. He's essentially a, a sociopath who doesn't have anything, ends up getting in a relationship with this amazing, successful woman. And if he just had his shit together, he could have done, had an amazing life with her. But he's a sociopath, so he fucks it all up and ends up trying to kill her daughter. And all this crazy shit goes on. Sometimes I look at people and I think, how do you do the things you do? Like, Craig Wright is so obviously a liar. He's so obviously not Satoshi. At the biggest stretch, he might have known Satoshi at some point. But he did not write the white paper. He did not build any of the early Bitcoin. He does not have the competent skills. Yet he is doubling down constantly that he is Satoshi. This this is compulsive lying, something I couldn't do. Look, I've told little lies in life and everyone does, you know, you know, maybe to your parents or to your children because you know you need to get away with something. But to compulsively lie that you are Satoshi Nakamoto and build a career off it, I don't understand how that works, but that goes into kind of the spectrum of narcissism through to uh, psych- psych- psychopathy. Do you, do you call it psychopathy? I mean, whatever, whatever the word is. He's on that spectrum where there is no empathy and there's no, there is no ability to th- th- have the ability to lie and not care. And I'm really intrigued by that. I'm so intrigued by that. I'm more intrigued by the weird and nasty or fucked up people. And so I would love to do that interview again. Because I would want to try and get under the skin of why he does what he does, you know, how he can do it. And I think it, I think it's really intriguing. Um, outside of that, because that, that's kind of an obvious one. What other one would I do again? Because, like, I, I want to do a better version or do it again because I want to interview the person again. It's kind of yeah, two questions. Yeah. Well, I mean, you talked about the platform thing, and I remember that was a st- – uh, um, with, with, uh, with Peter Reisen, um, that was kind of a big theme there. On, on Twitter, and I am, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm torn in a way, like, I understand where people go, if you allow somebody um, who, in their opinion, is a quote-unquote scammer, or a liar, or, you know, whatever, right, um, and you allow them to talk, that they could reach people who may not understand that, you know, who they really are, or what they're really saying, and, and, get them to go off on the wrong path right but i i don't yeah but you know what i'm going to give you an answer to that so yeah okay this this goes back to censorship right so if you if you block this imagine somebody does a google search and they find peter risen's web uh medium page read an article and they just find it and they believe and they go oh shit that's true fuck and they believe it and they just follow it or now they can do a search and they can find that. They can also find my podcast and they can also go on Twitter and find a bunch of people debunking him. The fact that when you shine a light on something that is not, which could be false or incorrect, you're exposing people to counter the argument to give a better debate on, on why it is. So I, I, I think shine a light on everything. Plus also, I do not believe Peter Risen is 100% wrong. I don't believe 100% of the things he says are wrong. Some of his experiences with Lightning Network are experiences I had. He's got questions that I've got. You know, I saw somebody criticize him yesterday. He tweeted out that we'd done the interview and they said, oh, you did an interview after only uh, playing with Lightning Network for a month. And I think, well, that's that's really fucking useful because there are going to be people like me who are going to come to the Lightning Network, brand new, fresh to Bitcoin, and then they're going to go, huh? So I think it's really good that, that I don't think it's a problem that he's only just uh, been exposed to it and, and just started looking at. So I say shine a light on everything. A lot of people don't agree. I get why, but it's not something I'm going to change. And actually, m- the most disappointed I've ever been with myself is when I cancelled that interview, when I buckled under the pressure of people saying, don't do the interview. And I didn't. And I really disappointed myself. And I'm never going to do that again. No, I was glad that you decided to do it. Um... Uh, and I, I do agree. I think that sunlight, you know, is the best disinfectant. And I think not to equate people, you know, not to equate like Peter Risen or any, or, you know, anybody quote unquote, that's a scammer with the, uh, um, as apples to apples with the far right, like in Europe or in the United States. But I think that a lot of the rise of that had to do with the fact that um, 
uh, with censorship, with with pushing these sorts of ideas to dark corners um, and those sorts of things faster. I mean, just as kind of like a larger view on censorship, not not so much uh, um, with with stuff in the Bitcoin space. But I think that ideas that aren't allowed to be discussed, I think, are the ones that should be discussed the most. Yeah. Um, and if they're not, we we end up, you know, you, you end up with these people. And that's why we have, I think, uh, so many of these, you know, things still lingering. It's just there's a lot of people come in and they hear, you know, just that. You know, because nobody in, in the space who considers X a scam wants to talk about it. So when they hear from their friend, you know, you should buy a, you know, A, B, C, D, E coin. Uh, it's going to go 100x because it's going to be the world's biggest computer and track all the bananas. It, it, they go, OK, great. You know, they go they Google and they hear only the podcasts about you know, from people that um, have talked about this. And by and large, they're only the people that are in favor of it because they either hold a bag of it or they don't understand it and they are big fans of it. And if you don't have any counters out there, then all they're going to hear is the stuff that you actually don't want them to hear in the first place. Oh man, listen, look, I get so many DMs and emails, like to the point now it's becoming tough to manage. I reckon I get hundreds of DMs and emails a week now from people who listen to the show, etc. Often, a really common message I get is that, I really appreciate you interviewing so-and-so or I really appreciate your style. I too am struggling with kind of understanding uh, this. For example, I too struggle to understand uh, Ethereum, like does it have value or not? If they go and listen to, like you, like you said, they might go and listen to say a Laura Shin that's listened to an interview and it's just a very pro interview about uh, Ethereum. And that's no discredit to Laura, by the way. And they might think, oh, it's great. But like you said, if they come to mine and they trust me as a Bitcoiner and they see I'm struggling with it, they might go, OK, guy, yeah, Pete's struggling with it. Oh, I've, I've got similar problems. OK. And they might go on a different route to go and kind of find their own truth. So I think it's really useful and I don't buy these arguments. All right, folks. Like I said at the very beginning, there was an issue with the audio, with me recording uh, for Peter's end of it. For some reason, it kicked off about 12 minutes too early. Mine continued for some reason. I don't know what happened. We tried to fix it, but these things happen. Um, so I, I would like to say thank you to Peter. It was a great, great conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. You'll be able to find all the links, all the notes and everything that we talked about in the show notes at digynocrypto.com. This will be episode 32. So just look for episode 32 on digitalcrypto.com and I'll have all of Peter's information, all of the links for him. And uh, I'd like to remind you guys, if you could really quick go over to iTunes, leave a five star and a written review. If you want to help out as far as for donating or tipping with Lightning Network, any of that kind of stuff, go over to supportmypodcast.com. That's supportmypodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.